This is Endurance Nation. Hello there and welcome to another episode of the Endurance Nation podcast. I'm Coach Patrick, your host on these different episodes that cover interviews with our members and with industry leaders, as well as regular topics that are pertinent to endurance athlete success. This time around, it's getting close to the fall, and I wanted to let you know that our season is kicking off on November 1st. That's right. Endurance Nation works through seasons, and our winter training program kicks off in earnest on November 1st. If you head over to endurancenation.us, you'll be able to enter your email address to get all the details about what's coming up and learn why starting in November is super important and how we can work with you over the course of the winter using our patented out-season program and the subsequent training phases of the year to create the conditions and knowledge you need to be your better and faster self. And if you're ready to get started early, can't wait till November 1st, we have a durability program for you too. So once again, head over to endurancenation.us, enter that email, learn more about what we are doing here over the course of the year, why Endurance Nation is different, why training with a team is the way to go, and how we can help make you successful. Until then, I look forward to hearing from you online somewhere and sit back here now and enjoy this episode. Endurance Nation. Hey everyone, Coach Patrick here, Endurance Nation, back with another weekly Coach Podcast, Coach Videocast. This is an opportunity for you and I to connect and talk about a key concept that is currently being discussed inside Endurance Nation, as well as to share out some of our lessons learned. As the world's largest online community of endurance athletes, we do all manner of sports from ultra running to ultra triathlon to regular triathlons to regular running to gravel racing, gravel biking, you name it. If it's long and takes time and is challenging and there's a finish line, endurance nation is there and we have experience in the realm. Together, we train and race together and, you know, make sure that we're learning along the way, becoming the best versions of ourselves as we can be as we leave this sort of live this endurance lifestyle that is all things manner of endorphins. So excited to have you here for today's episode. This week, I'm talking about hydration, hydration gut check, pow, pow, because guts and hydration often go together, like so brutal as it can often be if we don't do our hydration, right? Um, And in today's lesson, I want to talk a little bit about the parameters of hydration and the relevance of it towards your performance, not only in training, but in racing as well. Um, We talked about heat in our last lesson, and heat is becoming a common theme here inside these conversations as people wrestle with what it means to be successful in those conditions. Um, For me, hydration plays a massive role in that, right? So in many ways, I think about our bodies sort of as a, like a fish tank, if you will, Um, and hydration is the pump. It's the stuff that we're bringing inside the fish tank and make sure all the systems are good. And that fluid will also leave your body in one of two ways, hopefully. A third way, usually coming out the uh, mouth, not so great. Um, but through sweating, obviously, and urination as well, we're shedding the fluid and allowing our body to maintain key things like blood plasma volume, make sure that you're staying healthy and our body is functioning at its fullest capacity. Um, without the high, proper hydration, even with calories, things go wrong. In general, it's accepted that you know humans can only live about three days without water or fluids, uh, but they can live several weeks without food. Um, and that's just a function of how our bodies are hardwired. And I just want you to sit on that for a second and think about it because it kind of really drives home how important it is that we manage our hydration because calories are important, but not as important as the hydration towards our performance. If you can find that combination of hydration and calories that do the trick for you, kudos. If not, you can always solve it by knowing the numbers that you require for hydration and then calories. But we always start with that hydration first, always inside the team. It's just so critical to be manage it, especially in our training. Like race day is important. Obviously, we don't want to run into trouble, but especially in our training because a a tough, challenging session that is where you are underhydrated can have significant downstream effects for several days. Even though your body may be recovered from the session from a muscular standpoint, physiologically being dehydrated for um, long durations of even moderate intensity can have profound impacts on your body's ability to recover overall. Can quickly in a, in a bad way, leave you in a hole. Many people experience this in the early days of the summer when we're consistently training with numbers that we know from the late spring, but then the heat comes and we do a session at those numbers, even though it's hot and we really blow up. We crack on the day, we suffer through the recovery and we feel terrible for a couple of days afterwards. And it's all as our body tries to process the cost of that workout session. So learning what your body needs overall, super important. 
to help set the tone here, I'm going to share my screen very quickly. Here is a quick excerpt for you. There we go. Um, that I'll leave up on the screen so people can take a look at. But what I really want you to see here is the purple highlighted session section that I'll read for you now. For ex intense prolonged exercise lasting longer than one hour, athletes should consume between 30 and 60 grams per hour of carbohydrate um, and uh, drink between 600 and 1200 milliliters per hour. It's between 20 and 40 ounces of a solution containing both carbohydrate and sodium. Uh, per gram of fluid. Um, and that's a, you know, a general abstract study here. We'll look at the study. I'll pull it up for you. Fluids and hydration and prolonged endurance performance. Um, here we go. Journal of Nutrition, 2004. You can kind of see what it looks like here and the people who participated in that. Um, there's obviously um, significant research that's gone into hydration and fueling for athletes in the past couple of years. Uh, it's always good to know. But the baseline piece like that um, is we have to find a way to replace our um, the sweat loss through fluids um, that allows us to compensate for what we're doing. Specifically, it helps us maintain performance lower that heart rate. So by being hydrated, we get a lower heart rate for the same effort, maintain our plasma volume, the resiliency of our blood that we need, reduces our heat stress, heat exhaustion, and possibly heat stroke as well. And that plasma volume is critical for us to be successful over the course of our day on a race. Um, and hydration will do that by giving each um, molecule of blood an opportunity to, ha to have enough fluid to go along with it to make it rich as opposed to being like super, super viscous in terms of what's going through our veins because it's got less fluid in the mix. Um, it can be a much sort of happier, healthier aquarium, if you will, which I always think is a much nicer example than just talking about blood, right? Which people kind of get carried away with that or ostensibly grossed out as well. Okay. So super important for us to know. So those are the basics for you to think a little bit around the nutrition side of it from a hydration perspective, what we're looking at. So anywhere between 20 and 40 ounces or one or two bottles an hour of fluids that have carbohydrates in them and electrolytes. So we can make sure that we're staying on point. Those are kind of your baseline stuff. So this is our second bullet point here, which is getting the right stuff. You have to decide what's the right fueling mechanism for you. Some people just let what's on the course of the race dictate their nutrition. I fall into the other camp, which is to say that I like to pick my nutrition as much as I can, and I don't want to be forced to consume just the stuff that's on the course. There's different ways you can do that. If it's a shorter race, you can um, start with your own nutrition and then sort of gradually transition. So you've only got a little bit of time at the newer hydration and the early hours really matter more anyway. Um, another option is to make a concentrated bottle of the stuff you like and know that like, hey, if I've got a bottle of water, which I can get at any rest station and I put X amount of this bottle of concentrate into it, shake it up. It's just like a regular bottle would have been on its own anyway. So you can kind of do some back of the envelope math and that allows you to carry a bottle and then use what's on the course to supplement your hydration as well. So lots of other options as well. But those are two key ones. And the the important part of this one is just picking the fluid choice that's going to set you up for optimal success. So not rolling the dice on race day unless you absolutely have to, right? Like you wouldn't want to go into a convenience store in the middle of a hot ride and they'd let you inside, but they blindfold you and they'd send you in the back to find a, you know, uh, uh, the shelves inside the convenience store and you got to pick the first thing you grab is what you're going to drink. You don't want that to be like what your race day is. Who knows what that could be? It could be a monster energy. It could be a beer. It could be, you know, uh, you know, cold brew. I have no idea. It could be a disaster, right? And we don't want to be guessing at all in our race day as well. So making the time to learn what works for you and then facilitating that into your plan will be most effective. Okay. Number three, conduct a sweat test. This is perhaps the most important training session we have in our race preparation program for our athletes. Um, and it's an opportunity for you to see how your body performs under duress. So generally speaking, if it's a bike ride, for example, we'll do an hour and a half to two hours of normal riding. Um, we'll come back or stop if we're indoor, inside, weigh ourselves, and then train for the remaining hour at our ex desired intensity. So we're a little pre-fatigue. We train at that hour, um, eat, keep track of what you eat and drink, and then we come back and use our spreadsheet. You do your math you know, based off of your pre and post weight, and then what you consumed, we can do some math and see just how much fluids you went through in your system. And that's an opportunity for us to see just how much fluid you're consuming per hour, and we can use it as a baseline to set targets for our training. It's not an absolute number, 
or, you know, you're not a robot and we're not just doing ones and zeros. There's nuances to this as well. Um, but it is a good starting point. It'll let you know, should you start at one bottle or should you start a bottle and a half? What does it look like? And, and ultimately, where do you want to end up? We choose to do the sweat loss here in that second to third hour, for example, or towards the end of a longer training session, just because your body will be operating sort of at normal efficiency at that time, as opposed to the more extreme changes your body undergoes in the beginning of longer workouts as it, you know, kicks in the adrenaline and the warm up and your body cycles through sort of a rapid reset to get into endurance mode that may lead you to miscalibrate what it is you need fluid wise so we'll start with this number here later on okay then that's our third bullet fourth bullet let's outline a progression and by progression i mean how do we develop in our hydration because getting better at drinking the fluids you need to drink to be successful in race day takes time if you drink just one bike bottle per hour, we can't say, just drink two of these. Good, you're set. Like it takes time to get used to drinking two of them. So what's the progression? So you might say, okay, if I need to drink two bottles per hour, that means a bottle every 30 minutes. Right now I'm drinking one bottle every 60 minutes. What if I drank one bottle every 45 minutes? So basically you would draw the line at the halfway point and say, I've got to be at halfway here by 22 and a half minutes on the day. So the other 22 and a half minutes, I can get the other half of this bike bottle in. We can start to map that out and say, I'm going to go from, you know, one bottle to, you know, uh, one bottle and three quarters of the time to one bottle and half the time and sort of smooth out those numbers as well. So it's a multi-stage process. So you have time to get used to the fluids that you're consuming and allows you to adapt to that process. And you'll find that fine line between what's possible to consume and continue moving and what's too much and really inhibits your ability. You also learn a great deal about the nutrition choices you make at rest when you're actually training in those environments. And you may say, you know what, that tastes great when I'm standing in line at the store. Doesn't taste great out here in like hour two to three. It's good to know now, which is another reason why we test, right? Okay, great. And the last part here about the hydration gut check is kind of knowing the warning signs about hydration, right? And so making sure, because it is a delicate balance between keeping you hydrated, but allowing you to perform. But by being able to perform, perhaps under hydrating you, there's a sliding scale there. We always want to make sure that we're sort of in that optimal hydration space. No one will always be there. Um, it'll kind of correct back and forth, but you'll have a good sense. And it's a, an extra sip or skipping a sip as you go throughout the day that allows you to stay in that space. But we only get there if we practice with this and we have a good sense of where we started. <coughs> Some warning signs for you on things during a race you need to be paying attention to or long training ride. If your fingers get swollen, you're retaining too much salt, whether you're just taking in too much salt or whatever's happening with your body, and the fluid is amassing inside your system. It's important for you to slow down or sometimes even stop. Um, get those hands above your head, squeezing them, facilitate some of that circulation to improve as well and dial back some of that salt intake to make sure that your body doesn't carry or retain too much of that fluid. Another option is just dizziness. Usually uh, identifies sort of a, a lack of uh, potassium um, at the next aid station, having half a banana, which most aid stations have should get you back on track, will help settle your stomach as well. Um, so it's not necessarily a fluid problem, but it can be solved by adjusting your nutritional intake. Right. Uh, the next one here, lack of sweat. This is one of the scarier ones for me when you're out there training on the bike, for example, and all of a sudden you realize that you're not wiping sweat off your brow anymore. Um, you sweat out almost all the stuff you had. Your body's not, it's not doing the cooling part anymore. It's, it's that low on fuel that it's prioritizing like, you know, what it needs to deliver to the, your organs over what's coming out of your body to cool your skin. And that effectively, my friends, is a downward death spiral. <laughs> and so if you run into a position where you're no longer sweating, but you're still continuing to exert yourself, then you are definitely underhydrated and we need to slow things down and get you back on track, right? Uh, last but not least, one of the biggest issues that people have with hydration and nutrition is the gut. Is that sloshing, sloppy, gross feeling? How do you manage that? Well, for me, I always recommend that people carry external salt, salt, salt pills or salt stick or whatever you use, uh, because we can make sure that we get some of that salt into our system to help draw the fluids out of your gut through the stomach lining into your system. What's typically happened in that space is that the fluid is in a position where it's become inert inside your stomach and that more fluid is coming in than fluid exiting the gut and you get to general malaise and, and sort of soggy feeling. So incorporating some salt mechanism in there can help. Also reducing some of the general fluid intake, make sure you're having sports drink with electrolytes and not just water um, and allow ourselves to be in a position where you can be successful by knowing these warning signs. Um, having good hydration on the bike is always a process. There's just not one answer. You can't say, oh, I always do this and then just do it all the time. Even over time and different times of the year and different races and different exertion levels, all those nuances combine to create an ideal hydration scenario. 
your job is to have a good, smart baseline and then being able to experiment off of that with your training and early season races to make sure that you're ready to make quality decisions on the day. All right. So you think about that hydration. Remember, keeping your gut happy is a, is a key success factor with long course racing, whatever the event may be. Um, but it's certainly only a part of the equation. Do the right thing by making sure you've dialed in the right nutrition, spend time practicing it and capturing your lessons learned. This combination of steps here, or even a few of these steps, if you don't get to do them all, will really position you to be successful by the time the key season comes around. All right. Thanks so much for tuning in. Coach Patrick here signing off. Have a fantastic week, everyone. I'll see you next time. For more information about Endurance Nation, visit us online at endurancenation.us. The provided music is from the Podshow Podsafe Music Network. Check it out at music.podshow.com. Thank you.